The Pokemon fanbase has been well on fire for a while now. Many fans are upset at the moment, and rightfully so. I'm sure this isn't really news to anyone. However, a lot of what people are complaining about, at least from my perspective, is far from the greater problems at play here. And on top of that, there's a lot of misunderstandings, misinformation, and worst of all, lies being spread about this whole situation. Today I'd like to dispel some of these untruths, and make some of you aware of how bad things really are. Last month, a popular Twitter and Reddit post had been making rounds due to the inability of modern gaming journalism to check their sources and confirm any of its information. This post stating that the models for Sword and Shield have been completely redone from scratch, as well as Game Freak being split in half to work on their other project, Town. This is false. Not only is it a misquote of what Omari said in the article, but from what we can already tell, this plane isn't the case. We can't 100% confirm this until we have the game's files, but it's already readily apparent that these are not new, due to them being polygon for polygon, the same as the models we've had since X and Y, not even having been subdivided to a higher resolution. This also doesn't take into account the fact that the models have already been used in Switch games, such as Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. As for the notion that Game Freak is being split in half during the development of Sword and Shield, Game Freak, and for the record, most companies for that matter, always have multiple projects running at once, usually with smaller teams. For example, during the production of Black and White 2, they had already begun work on X and Y. It's also worth noting for Game Freak's non-Pokemon entries, the dev team throughout their entire life cycles are far smaller, such as the case with Harmon Knight, which you can see for yourself by looking at the credits for these productions. This whole situation baffles me, because while it is an attempted lie that so many sites and people were willing to eat up in defense of Game Freak, it actively makes the company look worse. By wanting to push this narrative, you're saying they're not only too incompetent to properly manage their company, but also incredibly cheap. Once again, that is a fact that these people are just kind of glossing over because it destroys their argument. And in this delicate 2019 culture, people just can't handle being wrong. And it's super sad to see that it's this, that people are just this intolerant of reality. <laughs> How ironic. The reason these models have been reused for so long is because they went out of their way to make them high polygon in 2013, so they would not have to worry about this exact same problem in the future. This choice being the primary reason why those 3DS games perform so poorly at times. So not only would all those sacrifices be for naught, but they would have the perfect excuse to make these assets better, yet choose to take the laziest possible route, redoing them with their same bland imperfections. That to me would be a much bigger indicator that they didn't give a shit than something like the National Decks being cut. Which, now that that's all cleared up, let's talk about the National Decks. People being upset by this is very understandable. Before we had more information on these games, a press conference was held detailing news of what's to come for this series, clearly to set consumer and investor expectations. During this, they talked in length about the connections we feel with our Pokemon, and how important bringing them forward with us to newer games and apps is, how we create these relationships that can be similar to ones we have of friends or pets, which seems to be the primary reason as to why Pokemon Home was created a service to hold all of our Pokemon, to transfer them forward, continuing the legacy of Pokemon Bank. At least this is how it appeared at the time. I know for me, a lot of my collection has come from trades over the years, many of those people I no longer even talk to, dating back to middle school, leaving me something to remember those times by, or in some cases, just interesting memories of how I got certain Pokemon. For example, a lot of you know I'm really into shiny Pokemon now, despite its detriment to my health. However, the first time I encountered one, I killed it. I saw a green zoo badge in a cave and I thought it was weird, so I just killed it. <laughs> Having found out exactly what it was later on, I was pretty upset. But then, the next day I somehow got lucky enough to run into a blue Trapinch, a shiny. Flygon, Trapinch's final evolution, is my favorite Pokemon. And this specific Flygon has been my sole favorite Pokemon ever since. There's a story or particular attachment I've grown for a lot of these creatures over the years. I really don't think they were exaggerating with how they framed our collections. That's why I felt so out of left field when we got the news that what was actually said was with the announcement of Pokemon Home, from this game forward, Game Freak's policy will change, and only a hand-picked amount of Pokemon will be in every game, something they would reiterate in future announcements, making Pokemon Home feel a lot more like a Pokemon graveyard. However, here's the thing. I am absolutely certain that I, as well as the rest of the fanbase, would be able to stomach Game Freak cutting out large portions of the roster if they gave us any noticeable improvements in return. Other series have done this in the past, 
Monster Hunter is one such example, where with Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, the game boasted a roster of 93 monsters. Upon fans becoming aware that Monster Hunter World, the next entry, would not have nearly this amount, many were disappointed, but it never grew much from that initial thought. Because in every aspect of World, you can see improvements, whether it be graphics, quality of life, systems, monster interactions, certain AI, and many other things. The developers also stated that they will focus on bringing more and more monsters to the game later down the line. And with the Iceborne expansion just released, as well as a few monsters given to us beforehand, we can safely say they kept their word. These series truly are the perfect comparison in this regard, as both are about the monsters first and foremost, and the Monster Hunter World team knew that. On the other hand, in Pokemon's case, the monster cut was told to be for the sake of balance, higher quality animations, and models being HD requiring a lot of work. So that was a fucking lie. As I mentioned, these models are the same used from before, and were specifically designed for HD consoles, as well as the animations being the same global ones we've become used to since 2013. Even with the new animations, they're not what I'd call high quality. They sit at the same standard of static Pokemon model being jiggled around, or some slight particle and camera work. It should also be noted that another excuse given is they have to make several Pokemon models for each individual Pokemon because of the Dynamaxing mechanic. However, that is deceptive language. These technically could be different models within the game's files, but they did not have to make multiple. In fact, the entire reasoning for this, if true, is just poor programming. Every Pokemon model exists in the game's files, as does the Cloud model. Typically, programmers would choose to have these models referenced individually and pulled from the pool of the game's files when needed, but not Game Freak. Let's look at Sun and Moon. It creates individual saves of the model for every instance of its use. For example, every area Lily appears in, the model being used is different, despite the model itself being the same. This is the case for every NPC in the game, and even for some other assets such as textures. This is programming 101, so not only is this statement deceptive, the only reason it has any truth to it is just incompetence by the developers. Had all of those earlier statements been true, if just like Monster Hunter we could see noticeable improvements, I think most would be understanding. But as it stands, Sword and Shield doesn't look like a console or next generation Pokemon experience. Even when we were kept to the same hardware in the past, you could still see noticeable improvements and changes that truly made it feel like the next generation. Going from Sinnoh to Unova, you could see a variety of improvements, graphically and mechanically, but going to Alola to Galar, not much has changed beyond the battle gimmick of choice replacing the old one. So I really don't think saying this is on the Switch or that they're making it as a handheld experience is any excuse. Let's also keep in mind that this is a console that's able to run Smash at 60 FPS with 8 players, all items on and stage hazards, with no noticeable drops. Pokémon Tournament and other vastly more demanding titles, again, at 60 FPS. Yet, even with Sword and Shield's lacking graphical fidelity, we still get frame drops, lack of details, pop-in, and other performance issues. Don't get me wrong, this game doesn't need high-end graphics or anything of that sort. I love highly stylized experiences, but this does not look like a project with a lot of care put into it. Even if we are to hold Game Freak to their own standards that they're setting with other Switch releases, such as Town, it looks far worse. Sometimes it doesn't feel like Game Freak really wants to be making these games, at least to me. Each release feels like it had less work put into it than the one that came before. I once said it felt like we're receiving the bare minimum but it's starting to feel like even less than that. Seemingly every time someone else handles Pokemon, a lot of these aspects are done better. We talked about the animations previously, but when we compare them directly to other developers' efforts, they're still trailing behind games that are over decades old. The animation in Pokemon Stadium on the N64 is still more impressive in some cases than what we're getting from 2019 Game Freak, and this only holds more true if we move on to Colosseum, XD, and Battle Revolution. Something interesting about this lineup is they also reused models and animations from previous games. My favorite example of this is how some clearly Stadium models can be seen in Colosseum. You might say, well see, they did exactly the same thing, but there's one key difference here. With each iteration, Genius Sonority improved upon this, updating old models, animations, adding a lot of flair and personality in some cases. That's what makes them different from Game Freak. There is nothing wrong with reusing animations or models, but when you tell me you're cutting other features in an attempt to improve such things, and all I can see from the majority of Pokémon are old ones that have not been improved or changed, well that is a problem. 
These games to me were how I envisioned console Pokemon to look like. From the environments to the battles, I thought we were always getting a taste of what's to come from the future of the series, but I guess reality is often disappointing. They might not have had all the Pokemon from some entries, or maybe not flesh out the story, but the compromise always gave us something, and that's what we're missing here, that something. Going further, many people have also pointed to a cheap Chinese knockoff Pokemon game, available on mobile devices, with a similar mindset, showcasing this as how Pokemon should look. As here as well, many of the animations are far more impressive than what we've seen from Sword and Shield, from the Pokemon attacks, background elements, and even some deep cut references thrown in. Now, obviously many were quick to point out a lot of the animations and such are stolen, as is a cheap knockoff, that's how things go. However, that doesn't detract from the point. The fact of it is, this game makes Pokemon look like the Chinese knockoff. The company creating the most profitable franchise in history is being outdone by a cheap Chinese bootleg. Usually when you see these things, they're laughable, but the fact that in a lot of respect, it's outdoing Game Freak says something about the quality we're receiving. For example, I just mentioned a lot of these assets are stolen from other games, most notably other companies who handle the Pokemon franchise, and I'm sure you've seen from the clips on screen, they have following Pokemon in this game, when in the hub. You might notice some of these animations are from Let's Go. But what about the Pokemon from other generations? These are actually also recycled from the traditional Pokemon games. While not properly implemented, models and animations of the Pokemon from generations 1 through 7 all exist in Sun and Moon, having animations for walking, running, transitioning through areas, and even lower poly versions of their models, which you would assume would be used on the overworld. Yet we're not seeing that in Sword and Shield. It's fair to assume these animations are used for when Pokemon roam the overworld. However, this is exactly what we've been talking about. We are really getting nothing in return from them cutting features. Each game has less ambition than the last. During Sun and Moon, they clearly cared somewhat still, but just like the battle models, they didn't need to redo anything. The code already even exists within Let's Go, so there was nearly no work needed for a fan favorite feature, yet even that was too much apparently. Which leads me to ultimately my biggest problem with the series. When you look at all these classic age-old franchises, such as Mario or Zelda, they have gone through many massive evolutions and innovations, both of their Switch games being the newest example of this. Pokemon hasn't really changed at all over the years. That's not to say something massive has to be done. Again, Mario is still platforming and is fairly similar even to his first game. Hell, Zelda's newest iteration is heavily based on modernizing what made its first release so special. We've seen other RPG series such as Dragon Quest make these leaps as well, so it being an RPG is no excuse. Even series like Call of Duty, which get so much flack for being the exact same thing continuously, I feel have changed or made an effort at points to evolve. It's so ironic that it's Pokemon that hasn't. I'm not saying I know how to do this, mind you. My personal idea would be to take a concept presented to us in Pokemon Origins, that each gym leader has a set team depending on how many badges you have. This would allow Pokemon to try something more open world. Choosing a starting town, maybe your starter choices would change on that. I don't know. I understand Make X open world is the laziest innovation in most cases, but as someone who hates that genre, I think it might be a good fit here. Although again, this is just a small idea I came up with. Pokemon just needs that something, especially if we're not going to go the high-end presentation route. Now at the end of the day, I do understand not everyone might take issue with all the things I've mentioned. You might find whatever Game Freak excretes onto your plate to be acceptable. That tastes as bad as it looks. If you still find enjoyment in these games, that's not something I wish to take away from you. But the issue there is that often people in this camp will try to take away the validity of criticism from others. Ultimately, this is why there's been so much contempt in the Pokemon fanbase these past two months. Because so many won't simply let people criticize the product. Fair criticism is not a bad thing. It feels so silly that I even have to say that. But I feel as though it's natural to want to see something you truly enjoy improve. And it's not as if we haven't seen this work. Fan outcry can make a difference, even if we look at Nintendo specifically, as recently as Mario Maker 2. Seemingly thanks to fan outcry, online play was announced to be added with friends in a future patch, after Nintendo dropped the ball by not including it, having upset many. 
It's important to keep in mind, there are always going to be people who unfairly whine or take it too far. I do understand. But that's also no reason to dismiss the very idea of criticism in its entirety. People will always find the one craziest person in the group and try to make it representative of the whole. What we've discussed today is more than fair critique. Yet, there's an excuse after excuse made for the shortcoming of these games. The outright lies told at the beginning of the video, just being the apex of that. But we can see it in a variety of ways. From people saying, oh, well, the game's trailer says the product's not finished, so clearly this isn't representative of what we're getting. Maybe they'll do this or that. Now listen, a trailer is supposed to sell you on their product. That's why often is the case that trailers will make something look better than it is. You're getting some of the most tantalizing bits. Not to mention, I'd like to point out Pokemon's history of spoiling insane amounts of their games through trailers. A trend that only continued to get worse with every entry. By the time Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon were released, we basically knew almost every single addition to the games. From the main story to the extremely lacking post-game, it was at the point where leakers wouldn't be able to spoil much more. I'm positive that there will be a few more surprises here and there, but let's be honest here. We've seen everything interesting or good that Sword and Shield has to offer. They played their hand, and it might as well have all been jokers. Pointing at them adding a hill in some background, or a minor texture fix here and there, doesn't mean that by November 15th, we'll suddenly have an entirely different game on our hands. Admittedly though, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure most saying these things are just overly passionate about the games, and feel the need to jump to their defense. While not agreeable, it is something I can understand. What's far worse though is those who should know better, but don't. Those who try to speak with authority on the matter, claiming ignorance of others as if they were informed, yet the reality is they clearly don't know what they're talking about. I've seen a person claiming to be a developer, yet not knowing that you can swap animations to opposing models, super easily. This does not mean it'll work perfectly, but if you're using nearly an identical model, of course it should swap fine. Pokemon does this as we've gone over, but this statement becomes even funnier when you take into account many games have highly detailed animations shared between objects with very different skeletons. I've also seen a big name talk down on others' disappointment while trying to frame the dex cut as a good thing, because this means we'll have a curated dex. Yet, if you simply played these games, you'd know that every entry in the series has a curated dex. It's called the regional dex. The national dex only becomes a thing in post-game. The core experience is focused on the regional dex. Even tournaments don't allow for its use immediately. These are but a few examples, of course, but I guess it's not really about the truth for some people. Certain individuals will just say anything for another lick of that corporate boot. You know, we were told this game was to be for the core players of the franchise, but it truly does seem like, ever since the release of Pokemon Go, Game Freak has almost entirely lost interest in doing anything at all for the core fanbase as they know how little effort truly needs to go into these games to sell. If my thought about them wanting to work on other projects more is true, then why would they if they didn't have to? Previously through interviews I've mentioned in the past, or just frankly looking at the games themselves such as Heart Gold, Soul Silver, and the Black and White duology, you can truly see that these games were created with passion and as a love letter to their fans. While nowadays you get less and less content, post-game continues to get smaller with each release. They can drop features like the Battle Frontier, merely on the grounds of, well, as they put it, people are perfectly happy with the ease of smartphone gaming, so why put in that effort? Their newest decision to cut the decks seems to be no different. Which leads us back to Monster Hunter World. It really is an even better comparison than one might assume. The developers of the game saw unexpected success, and with it, decided to use that money on constant updates over a long period of time, as well as to make an expansion so full of content that we had a constant string of reveals up to its release. Then look back at Pokemon. They know they're basically guaranteed to get around 15 million sales every time they release a game, on top of basically having infinite budget from all of their other ventures, such as merchandise. What do they do with it? Shit out a lazy, low-budget game that feels like it was made by a few dozen people, who seem barely more competent than Patreon scammer Yandere Dev. Think of it this way. Now that Pokemon is on the Switch, it will cost $20 more than before. You are paying 50% more than in the past to receive a product that has not just stagnating quality and content, but at this point, is significantly worse than ever before. You know, it's not as if I started out with such a negative opinion. I was very excited early on when Gen 8 was announced. I've dreamed of what the leap to consoles would do for Pokemon for years. It was finally here, but the more I saw, the more the reality of what we're getting sunk in. 
there are still good things I see in this game, mind you, while they refuse to drop the goody two-shoes rival trope. We also finally seem to have a rival who is just a pompous ass again, and you know, a hot goth girl, so that's cool. And the new team of antagonists being a bunch of obsessive fanboys also is a fun twist, though maybe Game Freak shouldn't criticize irrational fanatics right now, considering who's supporting their decisions nowadays. But I digress. There are so many neat designs and ideas present here, but it just feels like everyone at Game Freak is resigned to doing the absolute bare minimum to realize these concepts, except apparently Ken Sugimori and the rest of the art crew, who just keeps producing excellence as always, whether they've been driven by pure passion for their craft or just purely being horny, I don't know. I've always said Pokemon girls and guys are to Pokemon as to what Sonic music is a Sonic. No matter how bad things get, you can always count on that one thing to be good, but when you're delivering me a game that's literally just that, with better quality animations, models, just seemingly more care for what it is, then why are we still here? Just to suffer. That's the end of the video. If you liked the video, you can like it physically, support me here on YouTube by subscribing, becoming a member, or you can support me on Twitch, Twitter if you'd also like. I'd appreciate that a lot. And if you especially like my stuff, you can support me on Patreon. Obviously, it helps me a lot, it helps the channel a lot. Also, give me some extra stuff. Um, so, if you do do that, I end up appreciating it a lot. So, thank you if you do. Uh, other than that, the first thing I have to mention for transparency's sake, I do not actually think Pokemon Masters is that good. Obviously, I had that joke at the end, um, but it is a game I see a lot of potential in, and Dina has, you know, fixed game in, in the past. However, I've been waiting um, for like three generations now for Game Freak to fix their games, and they haven't, so I think I can give Dina, um, again, a little bit under for the doubt that hopefully it can become something better. And I also just, you know, really like collecting my Pokemon waifus and husbands. So there's that. Uh, this video also took a bit, obviously, um, longer was supposed to come out at the end of last month, but if you follow me on Twitter, um, or watch my streams, then you're probably aware that I was doing a lot of voice stuff this month, and I have the store coming up, and just a lot of stuff I've had to be worked on that wasn't videos. I mentioned last video that I have been feeling a little burned out, so I think it was good I was able to focus elsewhere for a bit, um, just for, you know, my own sake. But I am sorry if any of you guys, you know, you know missed the uploads being a bit more consistent. Uh, the only thing I feel like I really have to mention in direct relation to the video is I think some people might see the fact that there is no Elite Four in this game and the fact that they're doing an anime style tournament as a shakeup. But for me, because it doesn't really shake up the progression or mechanically of anything in the game, you know, it's still going to be a bunch of fights right back to back right at the beginning, um, an endurance test basically. It's, it's, it's still the same thing by a different name. Um, for me, I want a true shakeup of the formula and stuff like that for me to really be satisfied with something like that, personally. I guess it's also important for me to mention, I don't think Sword and Shield is going to be a bad game. I don't think any of the 3DS games are necessarily bad, but I do find them to be mediocre and they certainly don't feel as they have the same love and care, again, as some older games like Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Black and White, those were truly great experiences, and I love this series, so I, I don't really want to setter, settle for mediocre. I want to I want to experience things like those old games again and see something with a lot of passion and a lot of care again, um, because I certainly don't feel it right now. But yeah, that is the end of the video. I hope you did enjoy it as always, um, and if you did, again, I appreciate support in any way, as I mentioned in the beginning, and I will see you in the next video, next stream wherever you choose to watch me next, so uh, goodbye.